Hi everyone, today I'll cover aminoglycosides and vancomycin bases. So first I'll go over some aminoglycosides, and this is adapted from um, Dr. Emily Hahn's lecture from Pharmacokinetics last fall. So aminoglycosides are antibiotics that irreversibly bind to the 30th subunit of bacterial ribosomes, thus inhibiting protein synthesis. They work particularly well against gram-negative organisms, but they have very little activity against gram-positive organisms, as they typically acquire require another antibiotic to have a synergistic effect. And they don't really work against anaerobes either, since their uptake is energy dependent and when there's no oxygen, this process doesn't really work. Some examples of aminoglycosides include toromycin, gentamicin, and amicacin. There are others as well. However, aminoglycosides are associated with some major toxicities. This includes nephrotoxicity, which occurs in 5 to 25 of patients. Um, those at increased risk of developing nephrotoxicity include patients that have recently received aminoglycoside therapy, if they received aminoglycoside therapy for three days or more, as well as they have a frequent dosing intervals. Although toxicity can also occur. Okay, so now I'll go over some antibiotic pharmacodynamics. Um, and it's okay if you haven't had an idea, but I hope this overview kind of gives you like, a general idea of why certain targets um, are used in determining therapeutic doses for different antibiotics. So first, I'll go over time-dependent kill killing, where there's bactericidal activity that's saturable at concentrations 4 to 5 times the minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC, which is the lowest concentration needed to inhibit growth of the bacteria. Some of the antibiotics that follow this include beta-lactams and vancomycin. So ideally, you just want to stay above the uh, MIC for the entire dosing period. It doesn't matter what the peak is, as long as it's above the MIC, it's okay. Meanwhile, for concentration-dependent killing, the killing increases linearly with increasing antibiotic concentration. You want to ensure that you hit a target peak MIC ratio. This is uh, applied for aminoglycosides, where they target a peak MIC of greater than 10. So this slide just goes shows an example of the different types of killing. Uh, concentration-dependent killing, like rotulomycin, ciprofloxacin, or ticarcillin, which it has um, time-dependent killing. Another concept to note for antibiotics is the post-antibiotic effect, where there is a persi persistent effect of antibiotic even after antibiotics are stopped. So they continue to inhibit bacterial growth. But this depends on the type of organism, what antibiotic you're using, the concentration that you're using, as well as the exposure duration. Some aminoglycoside pharmacokinetics include that it has a very poor bioavailability. It's not really absorbed from the GI tract, and it's thus only used as an injection, either IV or IM. It has low protein binding and high water solubility. It actually concentrates very highly in the kidney and inner ear, which is why they have a lot of nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity associated with it. The volume of distribution also increases with fluid overload, burns, and critical illnesses such as heart failure and ascites. Thus, in patients with a high volume of distribution, they have a, tend to have a lower peak. The half-life of aminoglycosides are around 2-3 to three hours, and they're primarily excreted by the kidney, around 99%. It has a terminal half-life of 48-200 to 200 hours, and urine concentrations can exceed the peak plasma concentrations 25-100 to 100 times within one hour of drug administration and remain above therapeutic levels for days after the multiple dose regimen because of this long terminal half-life. So there's two different types of um, aminoglycoside dosing. I'll go over the first one, which is traditional aminoglycoside dosing, also known as multiple daily dosing, where you'll need uh, many doses to achieve therapeutic drug concentrations. This chart here just kind of shows the different dosings, what uh, target peaks and trough you're trying to get, and what to check them. Meanwhile, extended interval aminoglycoside dosing refers to administering a single larger dose and at longer um, dosing intervals to achieve greater efficacy and less toxicity. Essentially, you're trying to target an AUC between 70 to 100, as well as a peak to MIC ratio of greater than 10. You want to maximize the early concentration that would give a greater killing activity without concern for subsequent um, periods of sub MIC levels. It also decreases renal cortical and inner ear tissue uptake of aminoglycosides since the process is saturable, thereby decreasing the risk of nephrotoxicity and other toxicity. However, there are some limitations in that you don't really know if you achieve your pharmacodynamic goals. 
as well as individual dosing requires measurement of peak and random concentrations, around two to four half-lives after. However, this may not apply to certain conditions like with meningitis, endocarditis, etc., but you'll learn more in ID. And the table at the bottom just shows the different dosing and target peaks and troughs that you're achieving, as well as when to check the different levels. So this uh, is the equation sheet that was taken off of Blackboard. And please make sure that you're using your guys. This is the one for my year. But um, make sure that you guys are using the one that's uh, currently updated on Blackboard. So first of all, for example, of empiric aminoglycoside dosing, which means that this is like um, you're going to start the patient on antibiotics. So feel free to pause the video here and read through the question. And show you that this is taken from one of the e cases um, in fall 2019. Okay, so when I'm trying to solve this problem, it's nice that the uh, worksheet that's given on Blackboard is uh, really helpful because it outlines all the different steps that you need to take. I first like to write down the different patient information that the problem gives me. So like the amount of the patient's male, the height, the weight, threatening parents. I also like to write down the targets that I want to achieve. That includes the peak and the AUC. So you first want to calculate the creatinine clearance and the clearance of aminoglycoside. So you can use the equation the clearance of the aminoglycoside is equal to creatinine clearance times 0 0.06. And the problem already gives me the creatinine clearance, so this makes it super easy. However, if you're given the same creatinine, you're going to have to use the cross gault equation to find the creatinine clearance. So plugging those values in, I found that the clearance of the aminoglycoside is 4.02 liters per hour. The next step is to find the volume of distribution. And remember the volume of distribution may vary in patients that are obese or have third spacing. So we first want to check if the patient is obese or not. So we have the BMI equation, which is the patient's weight over um, their height squared. And we find it to be 31.6, which means the patient is obese. And we have to use a different volume of distribution equation listed here. And in this volume distribution equation, we have to find the ideal body weight. And the ideal body weight is uh, this equation right here. And we just plug in the different values since we're given the patient's height. And we find that the ideal body weight is around 55.974 kilograms. I had to um, carry a lot of uh, places after my decimal point. So I want to make sure that at the end, I round correctly and then my answer isn't too far off. So plugging in the ideal body weight back into the volume distribution equation, I find that the volume distribution is about 16.3965 liters. We then want to find the new K and the half-life. So this is kind of gearing us towards what model to use, either the goals in model or the short infusion model. So we can calculate the K from clearance and volume. So we find that K is equal to 0.24517. And we find that the half-life is 2.82655. So in order to determine if we're going to use the bolus or short infusion model, we're going to compare the half-life to the time of infusion. So time of infusion is about half an hour usually from the glycoside. So we're going to do 6 times 0.5, which is 3. And this is greater than the half of that we calculated. So that means the short infusion model should be used. We next want to determine what our dosing interval is. And usually with any of the glycosides, you can tell what dosing interval to use based on the target peak that you want. So the target peak for this problem is 20 to 30, and this is often the target in extended dosing intervals. So we're going to use a tau of 24 hours. We next want to determine the total daily dose for the amino glycoside. And this can be calculated using the AUC range times the clearance. So this is kind of just going to give you a range of values that your total daily dose should be in. And so I find this to be between 280 and 402 milligrams. But in order to do the actual dose, you're going to have to use the short infusion model equation here. So for CT, we're going to plug in 20 since that's like the lowest end of our peak. And make sure that we hit that, at least that bare minimum. And then for this T here, we're going to check our peak half an hour after a half an hour infusion. So that means the T is 0.5 hours. And I find that the dose to be 393 milligrams, and since amino glycosides tend to come in dosing intervals of 20 milligrams, I'm going to round this up to 400. And since we're rounding to a different value, we want to double check to make sure our AUC and peaks are hit. So I'm going to check the AUC first by dividing the dose by the clearance, and I find that to be 99.5, and that's within the 70 to 100 AUC target that we want to check. For the peak, we're going to use the short infusion model equation again, 
I'm going to plug in the doses 400. Um, again, this T here is going to be 0.5 hours since we're measuring the peak of half an hour after the half an hour infusion. So I have my peak is 20.4, and that's within the 20 to 30 range. And finally, for the trough, if they ask you to find a trough value, essentially you want to find a, um, a really low trough value for extended dosing intervals, as it should be really undetectable. And then for this T here, since the T here is the time um, from the end of the infusion. Then this gets kind of tricky because I also had a, um, uh, issues with this when I was learning it for the first time. So since we know that there's a half an hour infusion time, so that kind of takes care of half an hour. So essentially you only have 23.5 hours remaining from the time of the end of the infusion to your next dose, which is 24 hours from the beginning. So if you want to measure the trough half an hour before the next dose, you subtract half an hour from the 23.5 that's remaining, and we get T is 23 hours. So plugging that all in, I find that the trough is about 0 0.0819, which is essentially undetectable. So I'm going to say that the um, empiric regimen will be 400 milligrams of tobermycin IV every 24 hours infused over 0.5 hours. When you're writing the answer on an exam or anything, you want to make sure that you have the dose, the drug, the route of administration, um, how frequently you're supposed to give it, and over how long. Next is um, going over the revised aminoglycoside dosing regimen. Again, you'll be using the right hand side of the um, equation sheet, and this is also taken from one of the key cases last fall. So feel free to pause the video here to kind of go over the question and record down the different values. Okay, so to solve this problem, again, list out all the factors that they give us for the patient as well as the goal. So the goal here is 10 times the MIC, which is 10 milligrams per liter, as well as the current regimen, and how to diagram that out of the peaks and the trough that they give us. And this is just kind of um, determining the, the interval between the trough is taken and the peak is taken, which will be important when calculating our K and half life. So for K, we're going to plug in the values of the peak and trough here, and the time between the two, which is 4 hours, and we find that this is the value of 0.36658, and then the half-life is 1.89 hours. Now we're going to determine whether or not we're going to use the short infusion model or the bolus model, and we find that with the half an hour infusion, the short infusion model should be used since 3 is greater than the half-life we calculated. We're now we're going to find the revised clearance and line distribution, so to find those, we're going to use the actual current budget. So that's the 120 milligram dose as well as every 8 hours. And this T here is going to be 1.5 hours. And this is because the dose was given at midnight and the peak was occurred at uh, 0200. So if the um, infusion time was half an hour, that means the infusion was done at 12.30 a.m. And so the time between 12.30 a.m. and 0200 when the peak was reported is an hour and a half. And thus, yes, so that's 1.5 hours this T. So then this is the clearance and the you can then find the volume distribution. And then now that we know that, we now have to find the dosing interval. So since the target peak is 10 milligrams per liter, we know this is traditional aminoglycoside dosing. And the dosing interval is usually between 4 to 5 half-lives, which is about between 7.56 and 9.5 hours based on the half-life that we calculated earlier. And so I just chose something in the middle, which is 2 8 hours. We now have to find the total daily dose based on the AUC range and the clearance. We just multiply the two. We find that this is the range between 440 and 628 milligrams. And that's the actual fight to find the actual dose. We're going to need to use the short infusion equation here. And we're going to plug in 10 uh, for CT since that's our goal, as well as uh, 0.5 for T since that's when we're going to report it from the value. And we find out the dose is 213 milligrams. But again, we need to like the size of dose by uh, 20 milligram increments. So we chose 220 milligrams. And so I'll double check by plugging everything in. So um, we're going to plug in half an hour for T and we solve and we find it equals 10.3 milligrams, so that kind of fits our goal. And so the dose emission is 220 milligrams and twice an IV, QA hours infused over an hour. And now I'll go into vancomycin dosing. This is also adopted from Dr. Hahn's lecture last year. So vancomycin is a narrow-spectrum bactericidal antibiotic that's primarily active against gram-positive bacteria and has no activity against gram-negative bacteria. 
and is actually one of the mainstays of treatment for MRSA, or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It actually inhibits the bacterial cell wall synthesis. However, it has many adverse effects, including red man syndrome, which tends to occur when an infusion is given too quickly or when it's given with too large of a dose at once. It causes flushing of the face, neck, and thorax with increased heart rate and decreased blood pressure. Hypersensitivity reactions may also occur in the range from rash to anaphylaxis. It can also cause ototoxicity that's dose-related, as well as nephrotoxicity that has a gradual onset in like five days, but is reversible. So here are the different pharmacokinetic parameters of vancomycin. So its bioavailability, like aminoglycoside, is very low um, and poor, has poor absorption from the GI tract. However, this is beneficial in uh, Clostridia difficile infections. But this is where the C. diff usually stays. So essentially, PO vancomycin can be used in this sense. However, it cannot be used to treat sy systemic infection. Instead, you would want to use an IV dose. And IM doses are not used because they're really painful to inject to the patient. Um, for the bottle distributions between 0.5 and 1 liters per kick, it diffuses well into the pleural, pericardial, synovial, and acidic fluids. Um, the penetration to this uh, central nervous system is actually not very reliable unless they have patient has acute meningitis. It's 50 to 55 percent protein bond and has a half-life of 6 to 7 hours. It's primarily eliminated through a glomerular filtration. It is not removed significantly by hemodialysis and can remain in the system as long as seven days after the dose is administered. So vancomycin exhibits time-dependent killing. So essentially you want to optimize the time of drug exposure or target AUC over MIC of 400 to 600. And the post-antibiotic effect is not as great as aminoglycosides. So for dosing vancomycin, it's usually between 15 and 20 milligrams per kilogram infused over an hour every 8 to 12 hours. However, this may vary depending on renal function. And if you're going over, um, for every increase of 500 milligrams above 1 gram, you're going to add an additional 30 minute infusion time to prevent red man syndrome. A learning dose may be considered in severe MRSA infections to rapidly achieve targets. So that includes infections like pneumonia, osteomyelitis, myocarditis, bacteremia, and sepsis, and may also be recommended in critically ill or ICU patients, those requiring dialysis or renal replacement therapy, or those receiving continuous infusion therapy. A loading dose, to determine whether or not someone needs a loading dose, you can use the same uh, parameters that we used earlier in the poll. It's usually given as 20 to 35 milligrams per kilogram today, but not to exceed 3,000 milligrams per dose, and this may be lower in obese patients. And after you give the loading dose, you should initiate a maintenance dose at the next dosing interval. So vancomycin monitoring has actually changed super recently. Um, they just published um, an article in 2020 regarding updated vancomycin uh, monitoring parameters where instead of targeting a steady state trough of 10 to 50 milligrams per liter, we're actually going to target an AUC MIC ratio of 400 to 600. And this helps maximize efficacy and minimize, uh, minimizes the likelihood of toxicities like um, acute kidney injury. The reason why they kind of got rid of this um, steady state trough target is that it's usually just a surrogate marker for AUC, and there's very little evidence or very little data on the safety and efficacy of this trough. So you don't really know if this is if this helps minimize the toxicity. However, this AUC MIC does minimize the likelihood of getting toxicities. And of course, all of this is assuming the MIC is 1 milligram per liter. To monitor, you're going to draw two vancomycin levels to determine if the patient is at steady state. And this is usually done one to two hours after the infusion is completed for the peak, and the peak should be between 25 to 35 milligrams per liter, as well as 30, to, uh, 30 minutes to one hour before the next dose for the trough value. Um, some monitoring parameters include renal function, which includes things like serum creatinine and ins and outs, like urine output. Um, acute kidney injury can occur with vancomycin, as mentioned earlier, and you should monitor for serum creatinine increases uh, greater than or equal to 0.3 milligrams per deciliter over 48 hours, and this is indicative of vancomycin associated API and should be discontinued. And the monitoring parameters include resolution of infection signs and symptoms, fever, and white blood cells. Um, the preferred monitoring of AUC is actually with they use in software programs on the computer. So this is the equation sheet that was given on Blackboard. 
And again, you're targeting an AMC MIC of 400 to 600. And this is ankylosing your vision. Only when um, a trough is available. So we're going to, uh, here's an example of the initial vancomycin dosing. Feel free to pause the video here and try it on your own first. This is adapted from uh, one of the um, e cases. Okay, so here's the solution to the problem. So like I did with the aminoglycoside dosing, I like to list out the patient info first, like the high weight and creatinine clearance as well as the targets like the AUC MIC between 400 and 600. So we first want to calculate the clearance of vancomycin. Um, we would need to use the creatinine clearance, which is already given to us in the problem. And so when solving for it, we find that the creatinine clearance, or sorry, the clearance of vancomycin is 2.27 meters per hour. And then we need to determine what the uh, volume of distribution is. And because volume of distribution is affected by obesity and third spacing, we need to find the BMI, and we find that the BMI is 22.6, which is normal, so we can use a normal volume of distribution equation, and thus VD is equal to 56.7. In the next step, we're going to find the K and half-life to help us determine what model to use. So we find using the clearance and volume of distribution that we calculated in parts 1 and 2, we can find K, and then we can then um, find the half-life, which is 17.3 hours, and to determine if we're going to use the bolus model or short infusion model, we're going to compare 6 times the time of infusion, so the time of infusion is 1 hour, and so 6 is less than 17.297 hours, so the bolus model can be used. We're then going to try to determine the dosing interval using the equation C2 equals C1 e to the negative delta t. So for C2, we're going to plug in our target trough, where it was 15, and then for C1, we're going to plug in like a target peak, so let's say 35. And then we're going to solve for a delta T. And so I find delta T is about, to, um, dosing interval should be every 24 hours. Now to determine whether or not the patient would require a loading dose, we're going to solve for this ratio 1 over 1 minus E to negative K tau. So we now know that tau is 24. And we find that this is 1.62, which is greater than 1.33, and thus the patient may benefit from a loading dose. Finally, we're going to determine the total daily dose and the target of that by multiplying the AUC MIC range of 400 to 600 by the clearance of the vancomycin. And so we get this broad range here, 909 to 1363. Um, and we're just going to choose a dose that's kind of in the middle of there. And considering that vancomycin is available in 250 milligram increments, I'm going to choose 1250 milligrams. However, since it is over 1 gram, to prevent the risk of red man syndrome, I'm going to increase the time of infusion to an hour and a half. But since we're increasing the time of infusion, we still need to make sure that we can still use the bolus model or if we have to switch to the short infusion model. So, to determine that, we're just going to multiply 6 by the time of infusion, which is actually 1.5, which equals 9, and that's still less than the half-life that we calculated earlier, so the bolus model still applies. Now I want to double check to make sure that we're hitting our target AUC, MIC. So you find that the AUC is equal to dose over clearance. You find the AUC is 550, so that works. We're not going to check our trough, so we find that the trough is um, dose over VD, and we're using the same equation. And for this one, we're going to use T equals 23.5, since we're recording the trough value half an hour before the next dose. So the trough we found is 13.9, and that's um, below 15 which is good because you don't want it higher than 15. And finally, for our peak, we're going to plug in the value of two and a half hours for <coughs> our T here because now that our infusion time is an hour and a half and recording the uh, peak value an hour after the end of the infusion, that makes it 2.5 hours from the start of infusion. And our peak is 32.3, which is within that range of 25 to 35. And so the final dose is 1,250 milligrams of vancomycin IV um, every 24 hours infused over an hour and a half. And this is our final problem. It will be on revised vancomycin dosing. So feel free to pause the video here and solve it on your own. And finally, this is a solution to the revised vancomycin dosing example. So. First, I'll write down the patient information given from the problem. 
And then I'm also going to write down the current regimen as well as the peak and trough value that was recorded, as well as our target AUC and MIC, which is 400 to 600. So we're first going to calculate the rate constant, and I'll be using our peak and trough value as well as the time difference between the two. So that k is 0 0.04103 inverse hours. We can then use that to find the half-life, which was about 16.9 hours. We now want to know whether to use the bolus model or the current infusion model. And if you know that the time of infusion is one hour, uh, that means that six times one is six, and then that is less than the half-life that we calculated, so the bolus model can be used. We then want to find the revised volume of distribution and clearance, so we're going to use the equation from the equation sheet and plug in the values using the current regimen. So the dose is 1,000, and the dosing interval is 12. And then this T, um, which represents the time from the infusion, so when you'll get the drug level. So um, the drug was administered at um, midnight, and then the peak was measured at 0200. So between those two times, it's two hours, so that's why T equals two. And so we get a volume of distribution about 83, and we can use that to find the clearance, which was about 3.4. We then want to determine what the dosing interval will be. We're going to use this equation from the equation sheet, and for C2, we're going to plug in 10, since that's around um, our target troughs values, and for C1, we're going to use 35, since that's also where our peak value should theoretically be. And so we're just going to calculate that out, and we find that the um, dosing interval will be 24 every 24 hours. We now want to determine uh, what is the daily target dose. So we're going to determine that by using our AUC-MIC range and multiplying that by the clearance. So we get a range of between 1364 and 2047 milligrams. So I just took something in between that, like 1500 milligrams. Um, because we added 500 milligrams to the regimen, we have to extend the infusion time by at least half an hour. So we're going to use a one and a half hour infusion time. But since we're changing the infusion time, we also have to double check to make sure that we can still use the bolus model for our huge equations. So if to do that, we're going to just multiply 6 by 1.5, and that's 9, and that's still less than the half of that we calculated earlier, so we can still use the bolus model. So now that we have all these different variables, we want to double check to make sure that our dose will be um, uh, will target our AUC MIC. So calculating the AUC, uh, we got a 440. So that's in between our range of 400 and 600, so that works. We want to also check to see what our peak values will be. And uh, we're just going to use the Volus model equation. And for T, we're going to plug in the time from the start of the dose to when we're going to measure the concentration. So we're going to measure the, concentra the peak concentration an hour after the infusion time. So that means if you start... From, if you're counting the time from the, when the drug is first administered and the time of infusion is one and a half hours, an hour after one and a half hours is two and a half hours. So plugging all those values in, we get a peak of 26, and that's between the range of 25 to 35. And for our trough, we are going to plug in the different values, and for T, we're going to check half an hour before the next dose. And so we're going to uh, find that the trough is about 10.98, which is between the... Um, trough of uh, 10 to 15. And so our new dosing will be 1,500 milligrams of vancomycin IV infused over one and a half hours every 24 hours. That concludes this video. I'm really sorry that's a lot longer than usual, but I hope these examples help kind of go over and review vancomycin and aminoglycoside dosing.